Hello and welcome to Forward Boldly. I'm your host, Christine Niles. It's been five years since allegations first became public against Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, sex abuse allegations. That was in June of 2018. And what ensued was the notorious summer of shame when one of America's most powerful cardinals was outed, revealed as being a serial sexual predator of boys and young men. But it wasn't just McCarrick that was outed. It was also a number of individuals complicit, complicit in a network that surrounded McCarrick and protected him. They kept secrets about him and they protected him. Unfortunately, that complicit clergy is still very much entrenched and still very much in power, very much so. There was a lot of hope from a lot of us in the summer of shame that the church would start cleaning house. In fact, many of us saw it, even though it was a painful and difficult time, that we saw it as a time of hope, Our Lady cleaning house, ridding, purging the church of the filth that it stained and sullied, the beautiful, the beautiful church, the beautiful bride of Christ. And unfortunately, that hasn't really happened. Unfortunately, many of those same clerics put on a outward, an outward show of contrition, of sorrow, lots of words, but unfortunately very little action. So just as a quick recap, if you recall, during that summer of shame, there were many clerics in high-ranking positions who acted as if they had no idea. They were shocked. They were shocked to find out that McCarrick was a sexual predator. Here's one of them. The only thing I can tell you about McCarrick is I was shocked, overwhelmed. I never heard any of this before when the six years I was there with him. A number of us didn't buy Cardinal Farrell's explanations and his shock his claims that he knew nothing, nothing whatsoever of any of this. After all, Farrell was personal secretary to McCarrick in D.C. They lived together as housemates on the same floor for six years during the time that McCarrick was abusing boys and men. So many of us were a little skeptical about Cardinal Farrell's claims. In fact, many of us were skeptical about about many cleric's claims not to have known a thing at all. Bishop Stephen Lopes, who is, the or- who is head of the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, he studied at the Pontifical North American College, which, to which McCarrick had a very close relationship. McCarrick very frequently visited the NAC, as it's called, would spend time there overnight. And according to Bishop Lopes, when all this broke out, he was honest. He said, we all knew And he's talking about decades ago. We all knew. The seminarians knew to stay away from him. They knew he was a predator. They knew he liked boys and that he liked seminarians. America's most powerful cardinal, and they all knew. People were terrified to talk about it. On June 2015, before the summer of shame, uh, Father Boniface Ramsey submitted a letter about McCarrick and his sexual misconduct to Archbishop Sean O'Malley of Boston. Listen to this CBS News report. I had the impression that virtually everybody knew about it. Father Boniface Ramsey says he first heard about Cardinal Theodore McCarrick's disturbing behavior as early as 1986. Archbishop McCarrick was inviting seminarians to his beach house. There were five beds and there were six people. Archbishop McCarrick arranged it in such a way that somebody would join him in his bed. Ramsey, now a pastor in New York City, wrote a letter in June 2015 to Cardinal Sean O'Malley, who had just been appointed by Pope Francis to lead a commission to protect children from sex abuse. Ramsey wrote, some of these stories were not presented to me as mere rumors, but were told to me by persons directly involved. The response that I got was from his secretary, Uh, which said that this really does not fall under our jurisdiction. Cardinal O'Malley said that was a mistake. In retrospect, he said, I should have seen that letter precisely because it made assertions about the behavior of an archbishop in the church. So according to Father Ramsey, people knew. People knew going back all the way to the 1980s. In 2016, 
sex abuse expert Richard Seip sent a detailed letter to then-Bishop McElroy in San Diego. That letter can still be read at awrsype.com. That's awrsype.com. That is the website of Richard Seip's work. And listen to some of the contents of this letter dated July 28th, 2016 from Richard Seip to Bishop McElroy. It was clear to me during our last meeting in your office, although cordial, that you had no interest in any further personal contact. McElroy wanted nothing to do with him. Seip was there to expose all sorts of clerical sexual misconduct and ask for Bishop McElroy's help and having it handled and having these wicked men called to account. McElroy wanted nothing to do with it. Among those clerics who were called out in Sipes' detailed letter was Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Again, this was 2016, two years before the summer of shame. Here's part of his description of McCarrick. Quote, I've interviewed 12 seminarians and priests who attest to propositions, harassment, or sex with McCarrick, who has stated, I do not like to sleep alone. One priest incarnated in McCarrick's Archdiocese of Newark was taken to bed for sex and was told, this is how priests do it in the U.S. That was a priest from South America. None so far has found the ability to speak openly at the risk of reputation and retaliation. The system protects its impenetrability with intimidation, secrecy, and threat. Clergy and laity are complicit. That was true then, and it remains true today. Even though we had the summer of shame and McCarrick was outed, and people were named, the people who helped him, they were named. Now, a handful of people were forced to, to resign in disgrace, a handful of people, but a number of the men who, continue, who protected him continue to remain entrenched in the highest positions of power. Now, McElroy ignored that letter, didn't want to meet with him again. And in 2018, Church Militant was the first Catholic media organization to call out Bishop McElroy, alerting the public to this letter from, about, from Richard Seip to McElroy. We were the first ones to actually make that public, make that known widespread and then lots of other Catholic media organizations and eventually secular organizations, media, picked that up and they started blaring out headlines. McElroy ignored warnings about McCarrick back in 2016, which forced McElroy to have to issue a public statement claiming, well, at the time they were just rumors and I didn't know what to think and, you know, I didn't want to, et cetera. McElroy, if you recall, was the subject of my special report from last year titled Devil in Rome. If you've not seen it, I encourage you to please watch it. It's very eye-opening, and nobody else in the Catholic media world has put together a video documentary exposing McElroy's protection of a predator priest who was eventually convicted for rape, rape of a young woman who was in his spiritual care. He was convicted. This was a man, a priest, Father Jacob Bertrand, who confessed to having ritually abused a young woman in his spiritual care in a ritual that involved desecration of the Holy Eucharist during a sexual assault. I can't even describe it to you because it's too explicit and too graphic, Uh, but it was desecration of the Holy Eucharist in a ritual sexual assault. He confessed to this. We have the notes from the individual to whom he confessed it, that was handed over to police. Bishop McElroy was aware of that confession in 2015. In fact, when the prior bishop heard of of the uh, confession, heard of the allegations, he immediately suspended Bertrand. He was taken out of ministry. He was sidelined, as he should have been. But what happens, McElroy is installed in 2015, knows about the allegations. And what does he do? One of the first things he does is he restores Father Bertrand to ministry. He puts him back at a parish. And it's not until the next year when criminal charges are handed down against Bertrand that McElroy finally takes him out. But he does not pursue the process of laicization for two years. The only reason he pursues it 
is because Bertrand is convicted. He is found guilty of rape. And only then did McElroy finally laicize this priest. Now, this former priest is living in San Diego. He's, in, he's involved, very involved in an evangelical church. He's telling everyone there that these are all lies, that uh, his victim, Rachel Master Giacomo, made it all up. And he's involved in all these Bible studies and, and you know, um, couples groups and things like that. And McElroy has never been called to account for this. Never. He's never addressed it once publicly. Never. And even his own spokesman uh, wouldn't defend him when I called, when I, when I contacted them about this. But moving on, an individual who was outed during the summer of shame was Cardinal Donald Wuerl. Cardinal Donald Wuerl. Now, Wuerl clung to power for as long as he possibly could. He's the one, he was the successor to McCarrick in Washington, D.C. He was the replacement to McCarrick in D.C. It was very clear why he was chosen to succeed McCarrick, because he could keep McCarrick's secrets. And his secrets, that's exactly what he did. He kept his secrets until 2018, when he was caught red-handed, lying about his knowledge of McCarrick's crimes. Just like Farrell, just like McElroy, just like some of these other hierarchy who feigned ignorance about McCarrick's crimes, that's exactly what Wuerl did. He said, oh, I had no idea about any of these allegations. I am just as shocked as everybody else. I had no idea. The problem is that there's proof from Robert Sialik, who filed a lawsuit against McCarrick in 2004 for sexual misconduct. That lawsuit, that complaint, was placed in the hands of Cardinal Wuerl in 2004, who hand-delivered it to the Vatican. Wuerl himself hand-delivered that letter, that complaint, to the Vatican. When Wuerl was caught, you know what his excuse was? He said, oh, okay, now I remember. Now I remember, but you know what? I, I forgot. I forgot all about that. Really? Really. A sex abuse complaint, a lawsuit, which ended up being settled in Robert Silek's favor. Again, claims against one of America's highest ranking bishops at the time. And you forgot? Really, you forgot? Okay. Eventually, he had to resign in disgrace because everybody started turning against him. There were protests wherever he went. People were walking out of mass, saying, shame on you when he's offering uh, homilies. The seminarians didn't even want to have their pictures taken with him. Uh, this Cardinal World High School was vandalized, uh, the name spray painted, and the high school took his name off. And so he was forced, he clung to power for as long as he could. He was forced eventually to step down in disgrace. However, things didn't stop there. At the Baltimore bishops meeting that fall, they resolved that the very first vote they were going to take was how are we going to approach this sex abuse crisis that continues in the church today. We promised that we would handle it back in 2002 when the Boston Globe revealed and exposed the massive sex abuse problem and cover-up problem in the Boston Archdiocese, uh, which then eventually became a national thing where multiple dioceses were shown to have covered up sex abuse and all sorts of lawsuits and dioceses filing for bankruptcy. And the U.S. bishops issued the Dallas Charter in 2004, promising to take a zero-tolerance policy towards sex abuse. One of the chief architects of that Dallas Charter turns out to be McCarrick himself. And the bishops, of course, were exempted from any accountability. The public believed the bishops at the time in 2004 that they would clean up this mess. They believed them. And yet in 2018, it turns out that really very little had changed. And so the bishops were meeting in Baltimore in 2018 to take a vote to figure out how are we going to handle this? Well, on the eve of the vote, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, who was at the time head of the US, USCCB, president of the US Bishops Conference, uh, was told by Pope Francis through Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the papal nuncio, that uh, they were not going to have a vote. He didn't want them to have a vote. And the reason he gave was because he wanted to hold a sex abuse summit in Rome where they would handle it specifically. It turns out later on that the individuals who met together in Rome and then later on in Baltimore to ensure that this vote on sex abuse would not happen 
were the papal nuncio, Cardinal Wuerl, and of course, Chicago's Cardinal Blaise Supich. If you recall, Supich got blasted by the media when he gave an interview to a Chicago news outfit. And when he was asked specifically about Pope Francis, rehabilitating McCarrick, rehabilitating McCarrick, that was the real scandal, was that Pope Benedict had imposed sanctions on McCarrick after Richard Seidt sent him this detailed letter of McCarrick's crimes. Pope Benedict acted, he placed sanctions on McCarrick. He said, you can no longer do public speaking or public events, and I'm going to restrict your travel. Pope Francis comes in in 2013, and what does he do? He rehabilitates McCarrick. McCarrick is now free to travel. He's free to go to speaking games, engagements, do whatever he wants. And so Cardinal Subic is asked about Pope Francis' role in possibly covering up McCarrick's crimes and rehabilitating him. And what does Subic do? He snaps, and he accuses all of Pope Francis' critics of racism, if you can believe it or not. All of us were racist for criticizing the Pope. He then said, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. I think it's more important that we talk about climate change. No joke. No joke. It's not a parody. I wish it were a parody, <laughs> but that's, that's what he said. Meanwhile, Church Militant was calling for Pope Francis to resign. Let me play a little clip from that. On assuming the throne, he promised and repeated frequently the need for zero tolerance. Yet the record shows that time and time again, he has violated his own policy and covered for, resurrected, and even promoted multiple predators with deep ties to and involvement in the homosexual clerical network in the church. Many are waiting for the next shoe to drop and wondering just how much longer Pope Francis can hold out as calls for his resignation become louder and louder throughout not just the Catholic world, but around the globe. Now, let me make very clear. We at Church Militant believe Pope Francis is the valid and legitimate vicar of Christ. He is indeed the Supreme Pontiff. But his role in rehabilitating McCarrick was absolutely shameful. It was disgraceful. And we still believe that he should have resigned because it wasn't just McCarrick that he protected. As we revealed, there were numerous sexual predators that Pope Francis protected. And some of those individuals have since uh, been uh, sued or prosecuted in criminal courts and convicted people that he himself protected. If you all recall, it was in 2018 that we had our Silence Stops Now rally on the MeQ Pavilion directly across the way from the Baltimore Waterfront Hotel, the Marriott there. And all along the side of that building, there is a row of windows, glass windows, uh, which is the conference hall right outside the Bishop's Conference uh, Center where they were meeting. There's a long hallway, a long line of glass windows, and those windows look directly upon the Miku Pavilion. And we wanted to have our rally there. It was a peaceful prayer rally, but also a protest, a peaceful protest of the U.S. bishops, their complicity and their silence. And it was at the Silent Stops Now rally that James Grine first came forward. He first made his public appearance. If you all recall, he was the one who came forward in the New York Times earlier that summer, simply under the name James, to talk about his abuse at the hands of McCarrick. It was at our Silent Stops Now rally, like I said, where he first showed his face to the public. Now, since that time, like I mentioned, McCarrick has been criminally charged in two separate states. He is facing criminal trial in both of those states, and we will see what happens with that. But those others who protected him, like I said, are still very much in power. And this is why McCarrick still matters. The damage continues to this day, and there's a network that continues to this day, and they need to be exposed. They need to be exposed. People cannot simply roll over and forget about it and go back to sleep because that's exactly what these men want. That's exactly what they want. They may have had very um, theatrical penitential services in 2018 and very florid words of apology, but they were simply hoping the whole thing would blow over and that all of us would just go back to sleep. We cannot go back to sleep. We cannot go back to business as usual. 
Our church remains in a grave in a grave state of crisis, and we must continue to help expose this and help cleanse the church and pray, 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 sacrifice, sacrifice the church. We're drowning. We're drowning. So this is not a time to just sort of sit back, relax. Uh, life is great. I have nothing to worry about. Let me just go on business as usual and not pay any attention to anything going on. The church is in need. She's in grave need. Like I said, we cannot stay in oblivion. And we as laity, we can. We can do things to help clean up the church. Now, maybe we're not called to do the things like St. Catherine of Siena was called to do. She actually literally communicated with the Pope. She was partly responsible for bringing the Pope back from Avignon, back to Rome during the time of the Great Schism and the different anti-popes and popes. But still, so she prayed, she sacrificed. She was a tremendous saint, but she also acted. We have to do the same thing. Now, you may not have the ear of the Pope. Most of us do not. But do you have the ear of your local pastor? Can you speak your local pastor? Can you help him? Can you help him and encourage him to lead a life faithful, a faithful example? Because our pastors do need us. They do need our support, not just condemnation, but also our support, our prayers. As I've said many times before, I don't think we're praying enough for our priests. If we prayed more for our priests, maybe they wouldn't be falling into so many of these sins. I read up news stories every single day about, oh, this priest is, is, was caught in this sexting scandal, or this priest is caught in grinder, or this priest is, is suspended for this sexual misconduct. I'm reading about this all the time now. How many of us are praying for our priests? I'm serious. We, we're part of the mystical body of Christ, all of us. And we, we got to pray. Prayer is powerful. And God hears our prayers. He'll he, and he will honor our sacrifices, especially on behalf of his priests. Now, in 1986, a young woman was found strangled and half naked in New York's Central Park. The trail of the killer led back to Robert Chambers. He was a young Catholic prep school kid with movie star good looks. And it was the start of a sensational murder trial. There were headlines all over national media with his face, very handsome, very young, his background growing up, seeming, in, you know, seeming to be in privilege and wealth and hobnobbing with the elite in New York, and here he is on trial for murder. Well, what was very strange about that was that in the middle of that, that trial, um, McCarrick, at the time Bishop McCarrick, weighed in with a letter to the court asking the judge to let Chambers out on bail, saying very nice things about Chambers, saying he was a very young and respectful man and he didn't mean to hurt anybody, And it raised eyebrows. Why would a bishop, a very public, high-ranking figure in the church, step in and advocate on behalf of Robert Chambers? Why would he do that? Why would he draw that sort of scrutiny upon himself? It was very strange. And I remember after everything exploded in the summer of shame, I was made aware of this little tidbit, tidbit back in the 1980s. And I started to dig and dig and dig and dig, read newspaper clippings, watch old news reports and videos, read articles, do research, speak to people. And what I uncovered, I thought, was extremely eye-opening. First ever documentary looking into the close connection between Robert Chambers, known as the preppy killer, and then Bishop McCarrick. And it led back to, let's just say, it, their relationship went back long before the murder. It went back to a time when Robert was probably around 10 or 11 years old. And so the title of the spotlight that I put together was, Did McCarrick Make a Murderer? Meaning, was there abuse involved? Did that abuse lead to a downward spiral of this young, very promising prep school kid that ended up tragically one morning in New York Central Park in the murder of a young woman? That is a question that I try to answer in this spotlight. I'm going to play it for you now for those who have not seen it. Spotlight, did McCarrick make a murderer?
delivered him to the Department of Corrections. If it happened, it can happen, it did happen. There is no place in the church for a priest who would harm children. We all believe that the defendant was guilty of murder in the second degree. The injury tells a tale, and the tale is indisputable. It was considered the trial of the century, the 1986 prosecution of Robert Chambers, known as the preppy killer, a Catholic prep school kid with movie star good looks, accused of murdering an 18-year-old girl in New York's Central Park. Few have delved into his connections to the church, including his close ties to notorious sex predator, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. In this investigation, we take a closer look and ask, did McCarrick help make a murderer. And to Jennifer, nothing I can do or say will ever bring her back, but I am sorry. On March 25th, 1988, Robert Emmett Chambers, Catholic, pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter in the death of Jennifer Levin. While a tearful and distraught Mrs. Chambers sought the comfort of friends, her husband, Robert Sr., maintained a silent calm. Just moments before, inside the courtroom, the Chambers had heard the sentencing of their son for first-degree manslaughter. He was sentenced to 5 to 15 years. Two years before, in the early morning hours of August 26, 1986, the body of 18-year-old Jennifer Levin was spotted beneath a tree in Central Park, just across from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was strangled and half naked. When police arrived at the scene, they didn't know her killer was still there, only yards away, observing. As police began interviewing Jennifer's friends, the name Robert Chambers kept coming up. They called on him the next day at his mother's apartment on 11 East 90th Street. He willingly agreed to come in for questioning. At first, he claimed he had no idea what happened. When police noticed scratch marks on his face, he told them it was his cat. But he let slip that he had walked with Jennifer out of Dorian's Red Hand Bar that night on the Upper East Side. That's when police realized they were likely talking to the victim's killer and started rolling the cameras. What was going on? Jennifer was laughing at me and talking to another guy at the same time. Did, did, did this get you annoyed? Or? Yeah, because she, came, she asked me to come over and talk to her and then I'm getting in trouble and she's laughing at me and also the fact that the girl I was supposed to meet, Alex, the girl I like, was yelling at me in front of everybody, so it was embarrassing. Jennifer asked Chambers to go outside. They both left Dorian's and started walking toward Central Park, where Chambers says they sat under a tree. She tied him up, and they engaged in rough sex. She then she sat up, and she like sat on my face, and then she dug her nails into my chest, and I have scratches right here. And then she began to jerk me off again. And then she squeezed my, she squeezed my and this really hurt. And I just, I couldn't take it anymore. And I was screaming in pain. He claimed it was just a romp gone wrong, her death an accident. So I reached up like this and grabbed, and I came down like that on my hand. All right, she's, she's flipping backwards. She came over this way and landed right there. Police didn't buy it, but as they pressed him, Chambers said something peculiar. But something triggered you. She took me out of there. She molested me in the park. She hit she me. How could she molest you? You see, we're talking about what girls. Girls cannot. Girls she, she cannot can't, do it to what a you, guy. What are you telling me? She tried. She's raping you in the park. I'm sure that I've I've heard about other men being raped. Men being held well, up well, high. I'll up. tell you one thing. I haven't. Well, good. You're lucky. You're very lucky. It's I not mean, a very. It, it happens. It can happen. It did happen. Those comments, up till now largely ignored, 
may be a clue that could help unravel the dark history that led to that 1986 death in Central Park. Was Chambers hinting at something that may have happened to him years ago at the hands of America's most notorious clerical predator? Chambers was arrested for murder. The incident made national headlines, the public mesmerized by the tall, debonair teen on trial for homicide. Only weeks later, he'd be back out on the street. <laughs> With the help of one man in particular, Theodore McCarrick. Originally from New York, McCarrick was at the time Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey, and wrote a letter to the court on Chambers' behalf. From the New York Daily News, McCarrick said the six foot four preppy had a gentleness and a very special respect for persons, adding, I believe it reflects a true respect for his neighbor and an unwillingness to cause pain. Another cleric, Monsignor Thomas Leonard, who once taught Chambers at St. David's School, also lent his support. From a 2018 New York Times article, Chambers' mom asked him to write a letter to the judge in her son's case and to appear at the bail hearing. Leonard complied among 45 total who submitted letters on Chambers' behalf. The Monsignor appeared in court at the bail hearing alongside a dozen or so of Chambers' friends. With such support, Judge Howard Bell noted, I am inclined to set bail. It was set at $150,000, too high for the Chambers to pay. Support poured in, including from Jack Dorian, owner of Dorian's Red Hand Bar, who put up his $650,000 penthouse as collateral. Monsignor Leonard also contributed. An October 23, 1986 UPI report notes Linda Fairstein, the prosecutor, accused the church of raising money for a murderer. It led to angry denials by Chambers' defense attorney, Jack Littman, who said, absolutely no one in the church is soliciting funds on his behalf. Chambers was freed on bail on October 1st. By agreement of the court, Monsignor Leonard was tasked with keeping an eye on Chambers, allowed to stay at the rectory of his parish, Church of the Incarnation, with a court-imposed curfew, a curfew Chambers flouted. Here's a photo taken at the time of Chambers casually walking the city streets with his Walkman past dark. Leonard would later serve as Chambers' spiritual advisor, visiting him frequently in prison. Several years after Leonard's death in 2021, He'd be sued by a man claiming that in 1976, when he was around 11 years old, at Church of the Incarnation, Leonard sexually assaulted him. I asked McCarrick over and over again why he would help Robert get out of jail, and he didn't have an answer other than his faith would have him do this. Linda Fairstein was the prosecutor assigned to the case. In comments to Church Militant, she confirmed she was troubled by McCarrick's support of Chambers, which helped sway public opinion. I was frankly quite shocked to receive a copy of the letter sent to the court by McCarrick in support of Robert Chambers. I just thought it was completely inappropriate in a murder case in which there was no doubt who the killer was. Fairstein confirmed McCarrick showed up frequently at court hearings in his collar. It was as though he, by his presence and by his exalted position, was embracing the killer. After he refused to return her phone calls, she drove to his residence and confronted him privately. He downplayed his ties to Chambers. McCarrick would sort of pull back and say that he had not had a close relationship with Robert, I got the sense that McCarrick was trying to really tie the, his relationship to the good work of Phyllis Chambers for the Cardinal of New York, and that Robert was an offshoot of that 
primary relationship. Just two weeks after Chambers made bail, he was back in court and in handcuffs, where new charges were leveled against him for three penthouse burglaries he'd committed the year before. He had stolen more than $70,000 worth of furs, jewelry, and silver from posh apartments to support his cocaine habit, with the help of a street thug and rapist. Chambers was born to Catholic parents. His mother, Phyllis Shanley, was born in County Leitrim, Ireland. moving to New York in the 1950s. She never lost her Irish brogue. She got a job as a nurse at the Foundling Hospital, run by the Archdiocese of New York. She was also a private nurse to famous families, including the Hursts, the Hammersteins, and even the Kennedys, watching after infant John F. Kennedy Jr. It was during this time Phyllis would get a taste for luxury and high living, determined to make a good life for herself and her future family. Since I was appointed the Archbishop of New York, Phyllis would later serve as nurse for New York's Cardinal Terence Cook. She would come to know his secretary, a young rising star, Father Theodore McCarrick. She would also come to know McCarrick's mother, Margaret McLaughlin, who worked for the Archdiocese at the time. Not much is known about McCarrick's mother other than what he said of her publicly. From a 2001 New York Times article, his seafaring father died of tuberculosis when he was three years old, forcing his mother, Margaret McLaughlin McCarrick, to find work at a Bronx factory making automobile parts and to live with various relatives in an extended Irish-American clan. A 1940 U.S. Census lists Margaret as 46 years old at the time, widowed and living in New York. 20 years after her death, her son would dedicate an elderly care facility to her, breaking ground on the Margaret McLaughlin McCarrick Care Center in Franklin, New Jersey. Long before this, in the 1960s, Phyllis and Margaret would become fast friends, their friendship revolving around their Catholic faith, their shared Irish heritage, and their relationship with McCarrick. In 1965, Phyllis would marry Bob Chambers from an Irish-English family of means. A year later, they'd give birth to Robert Emmett, named after the 19th century Irish patriot and hero. But the marriage was troubled, Bob struggling with drinking. They eventually separated, and Phyllis poured her affections into her son, determined to make him part of New York's elite. She enrolled him at age four in the upscale St. David's School on East 89th Street. He did well, serving as an altar boy, elected to the school's honor guard, excelling at marksmanship and athletics. He won an award for public speaking, reciting the final speech of the Irishman for whom he was named as he stood on the gallows. It was there in 1977 that McCarrick would serve as Chambers' confirmation sponsor when he was in sixth grade. He did so as a favor to Chambers' mother, Phyllis, who often turned to McCarrick for help in mentoring and guiding her young son. She would also ask McCarrick to serve as a reference for Robert each time she tried to secure him a position at a good school or a social club. That same year, McCarrick would get a promotion, consecrated auxiliary bishop in New York. At age eight, Chambers joined the Knickerbocker Grays, New York's oldest after-school boys group, which counts among its illustrious alumni, the Vanderbilts and the Rockefellers. In 1979, his mother became president of the group. There, Robert moves from cadet captain to lieutenant colonel, the group's second highest rank. This gave McCarrick a chance to spend more time with young Robert. From a 1979 New York Times article on the Knickerbocker Grays, Bishop Theodore McCarrick, the Roman Catholic Auxiliary Bishop of New York, who was attending as a guest of Mrs. Chambers, discoursed briefly on the Greys' possible role as heroes in a heroless world. It was in that same time period McCarrick would acquire the notorious nickname Uncle Ted, cultivating close ties to Catholic families in the area, 
spending time with their children, whom he would call nephews, even spending overnight trips with them. Parents trusted the bishop with their children, honored he'd choose their sons to spend time with him, never suspecting he might harm them. It was during this time McCarrick's most famous victim, James Grine, was abused as an adolescent. I am James Grine, a child, now man, who was physically abused by Theodore McCarrick for 18 years. James was first assaulted at age 11, and decades later he'd be present as criminal charges were read out against McCarrick in a Dedham, Massachusetts courtroom. It would be the first criminal charges he has ever faced for assaulting an unnamed 16-year-old boy. Returning to the timeline, after being appointed Bishop of Metuchen, New Jersey in 1981, McCarrick would go on to abuse others, including Robert Sialek, a seminarian in his 20s. Sialek went public in 2018, during the notorious Summer of Shame, telling the New York Times what he endured at McCarrick's hands. Bishop McCarrick began inviting him on overnight trips, sometimes alone and sometimes with other young men training to be priests. There, the bishop would often assign Mr. Sialek to share his room, which had only one bed. The two men would sometimes say night prayers together before Bishop McCarrick would make a request, come over here and rub my shoulders a little, that extended into unwanted touching in bed. The Metuchen Diocese paid a settlement to Sialek in 2005 after he filed a civil lawsuit. That payout was known to both Cardinal Donald Wuerl, McCarrick's successor in D.C., and Cardinal Joseph Tobin, McCarrick's successor in Newark, New Jersey, even as both men remained silent about their knowledge of McCarrick's crimes. In 1981, McCarrick would be assigned to serve as chaplain at New York's Foundling Hospital, at the time on 68th Street. The Foundling was established in 1869 by the Sisters of Charity as an orphanage, since branching out to cover social services for families in general. As mentioned, Robert's mother Phyllis worked as a nurse at the Foundling. On late night shifts, she'd stay in a spare apartment above the hospital. Others also had access to the apartment, including McCarrick, who had his own key. But his uses were more sinister. The New York Times mentions the apartment in its July 2018 report on Robert Sialek. Bishop McCarrick sometimes took him to a small apartment on an upper floor of a hospital that he used for overnight stays in the city and directed Mr. Sialek to share his bed. Church Militant has since confirmed with multiple victims, whose names we will not reveal in order to protect their privacy, that McCarrick assaulted them in that very apartment. Could it be that in the same apartment where Phyllis Chambers stayed, an apartment her son would have been familiar with, the same apartment where McCarrick would take victims and molest them, that Robert may have been among them? It's unclear how old Robert was when he may have been first abused. We know McCarrick was already involved in his life in middle school, when he was an altar boy at the upscale St. David's, where McCarrick served as his confirmation sponsor. We know Phyllis often turned to McCarrick to ask favors for her son, writing letters of reference on her son's behalf. In return for such favors, McCarrick would expect favors of his own from Robert. Sometime between then and Robert's 1980 enrollment in Coate Rosemary Hall in Connecticut, he started to show a marked decline, turning from star student to drug-addicted thief. His first stint in rehab took place when he was only 14, remarkably young. After a year at Coate as a problem student, he wasn't invited back. In fall of 1981, he was enrolled in the elite Browning School on East 62nd, but would often skip class, losing interest in studies, dabbling in marijuana and LSD. He'd also become part of the club scene. He was thrown out of Browning for drug use and stealing a wallet from a teacher.
In 10th grade, he attended York Prep on East 85th, likely with the help of McCarrick. There, things went from bad to worse, his drinking and drug use leading to petty theft to pay for his habit. According to a 2008 New York Magazine article, friends remember him being constantly stoned, affecting an I-don't-give-a-damn-about-anything attitude. While Fairstein couldn't confirm theories of Chambers' abuse, she wouldn't be surprised if McCarrick and Chambers used each other for their own ends. McCarrick had his uses of the young man, and Chambers used anybody he could to help him in any way he could. Chambers was addicted to, to drugs at a very early age, and I think he would have been doing favors for anybody who at that young age could put in his hands alcohol and or drugs. Would I be shocked if I found out that Robert Chambers was sexually abused by Teddy McCarrick? Not at all. Could it have happened? Absolutely. Robert at the time fits the profile perfectly. He's very vulnerable. He's uh, the product of a, uh, a broken marriage. To look back, your head spins. Started to hurt and I told her to stop and she just kind of laughed and sat up on my face and dug her nails into my chest. It was in that moment, Robert claims, he snapped, grabbing her by the neck and throwing her over his shoulder. But at least one expert questions that theory saying this was a deliberate attack, a sustained and vicious killing, not a momentary reflex. Could it have been the culmination of years of abuse, Robert taking out his violent, pent-up rage on his own helpless victim? That was not an accident. He knew exactly what he was doing. So how can that be an accident? Dr. Werner Spitz, world-renowned forensic pathologist of over six decades, has testified in high-profile cases including John F. Kennedy, O.J. Simpson, and John Bonet Ramsey. According to him, Levin's cause of death was asphyxiation by strangulation. He twisted the, the noose, and the noose meaning the shirt became a noose. He twisted it, but he knew that he's twisting it. There's no way that he could not have known. From the New York Daily News in 1988, there were 25 prosecution witnesses. The strongest was Dr. Werner Spitz, the Detroit medical examiner. And the scrapings on the neck, both made by him twisting the noose and her trying to breathe by moving the noose down, downward. So that goes without saying that that almost is like somebody is making a drawing on her skin of what really went on. And that is not changeable. Well, I just grabbed her and yanked her as hard as I could, and she just flipped over me and landed right next to the tray. And then she didn't move. No, he never threw her on behind him. That is not the case. He, first of all, she faced him. And he twisted it. And that is visible in the wound, because the wound actually is two uh, lines of uh, abrasion, of scraping of the skin, and then two more further down because she pulled it down. Because she wanted to breathe, and she couldn't breathe. These are not, these are not tough, really. Take a look at this. Just take a look at her neck. Robert, Robert. Yeah, yeah. you see how, how discolored and, and even bleeding her neck is? Dr. Beasley says Chambers broke his right hand punching something or someone the night she died. It's hit something hard at a very high velocity and a lot of impact. A hard thing could be a, could be a bone, the bone around the orbit or the uh, above the eye. could be, But it had to be a very hard object delivered at a very uh, uh, strong manner. Not something accidental. It's not possible. In addition to being strangled, Levin was severely beaten on the face. She had a swollen black eye and a loose tooth. There was blood on her blouse and jacket and foot marks on her back, showing she was likely stomped after death. The uh, 
injury tell, tells a tale, and the tale is indisputable. After the jury took nine days to deliberate, fearing a hung jury, the DA's office and the defense worked out a plea deal. And I wish to apologize to the family and to our friends for all the trouble that they've gone through. I've never wanted any of this to happen to anybody. Chambers pled guilty to manslaughter. He was sentenced to 5 to 15 years. Because of bad behavior, he served the full 15 years. What would cause someone to do drugs and then like the feeling so much that they become addicted? And then fail out of school. Probably then... a child who was trying to get over some trauma. And then who would still be on this potential murderer side than someone that also wants to keep secrets? I think it's totally plausible. Mm-hmm. It makes the whole thing even sadder. Just, just sort of what, if that is true, the impact of abuse like that and what it, I mean, someone's, someone died, you know, and, and who knows? Alex Cap was Chambers' girlfriend in 1986. She's the one Chambers referred to in his police interrogation tape. In an email to Church Militant, Cap wrote, For what it's worth, I believe in my heart that Robert Chambers was molested. In fact, when I heard about this for the first time, it was as if all the pieces of the puzzle came together. Even before the murder, Robert's behavior in the months and years following his relationship with McCarrick would be a giant red flag for abuse today. It was a tragedy all around. Today, Chambers is serving out his time in Shawangunk Prison in Wallkill, 80 miles north of New York City, on unrelated drug charges. He gets out next year at age 57. Church Milton contacted him numerous times for an interview, but received no response. Questions remain. Was Chambers among McCarrick's many casualties? Does the alleged abuse explain why he went from stellar schoolboy to drug-addicted teen turned killer? Is it the secret source of a simmering years-long rage which exploded in a few violent moments one dark morning in Central Park with tragic results? The sex abuse does not excuse Chambers' crime, and he was rightly punished. Meanwhile, McCarrick, who spent decades destroying young lives, Chambers likely among them, has never faced justice for his own crimes. Christine Niles, Church Militant, Detroit.